What's up everybody? It's Reese. Hi Gabby. From RNG Reptiles. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. If not, then welcome back. We hope you've had a fantastic week. And today we're going to talk about what to feed, how to feed, and when to feed your snake collection. Or at least how we do it. Yeah. So let's dive in. table in front of me you can see just some of our collection of frozen rodents that we have to keep in stock uh, to actually feed all of the collection. So over here we've got a selection of different sized mice, we've got some different sized rats here, we've got multi mammates also known as African soft fur rats here and lastly we've got gerbils. So each of these different types of food is optimum for a different type of snake and of course the size that we would feed to a snake is kind of relative to the size of the snake itself. So the smallest mice that we have are pinkies and these start at one gram and then the largest rodents we have are these small adult rats which are 100 grams. Um, and just before we actually like, get into some of the finer detail, I'll just quickly show you, if you can follow me Gabby, the fact that we have a chest freezer which we entirely dedicate to holding all of the frozen rodents that we require. So the mice in particular are the rodents of choice that we choose to feed to the corn snakes, predominantly because of their availability for one, and secondly, the fat to protein uh, ratio that they actually have. So mice are typically much leaner, much lower fat content, um, and because of that, much more appropriate food type for the corn snakes. Um, the rats, on the other hand, much, much higher fat content, and once you get to the adult sizes, really the only difference between a jumbo rat and a small rat is gonna be the fat content and yeah, basically the size is gonna be appropriate for the size of the snake that you feed them. Um, we do also have, um, well they're called multi mammates here in the UK, but they're often referred to as African soft fur rats. Um, now both the African soft fur rats and the gerbils, we keep in stock for any snake that decides that it just does not want to eat. Um, Royal pythons or ball pythons are just known for being so finicky and so picky and it drives me crazy. Honest to God, there are some of our animals which drive me round a bend because they just refuse to eat. Um, so just part of dealing with these picky eaters, these animals that refuse to eat, is just keeping a stock of variety so that if they don't want to eat a rat one week then I'll also defrost a multi mammate or in extreme circumstances a gerbil um, and see if that different scent might stimulate a feeding response. So with our adult corn snakes we typically feed them once every two weeks and we'll go for either an extra large or ex breeder mouse for those. Um, with the royal pythons um, None of them are currently what I would consider to be fully grown um, and as a result, or in correspondingly to that, um, I feed all of the royal pythons that we have uh, once a week. Now prior to them hitting the 400-500 gram kind of mark, I was feeding them once every five days because I wanted to give them all of the nutrients that they have to grow. And of course, now that they are all above that mark, uh, we're able to feed them larger prey items. That means they get more calories in them just naturally by virtue of the size of the prey that they can actually consume. Um, so there's not really the same kind of pressure to feed them a bit more often. Um, some of the breeders that you, you'll come across 
all over the world. This isn't something that's isolated to any kind of location. But some of the breeders that you come across will actually do something called power feeding their animals. And that's where they will feed an appropriately sized animal, but they'll feed it two or even three times a week instead of the once per week that we do. And, and is there something wrong with power feeding? So there's pros and cons to power feeding. The pros, arguably, are that the animals will grow much quicker. And for any breeder who is waiting on an animal to get to size to start producing eggs, the sooner the better, so they can actually start to earn a return on their investment. The other side of the coin though, is that you may end up having obese animals. And just like with human beings, if you have an animal or a creature which is overweight, for an extended period of time especially, you, you are inevitably going to shorten the lifespan of that animal. Now, arguably, some of our animals are slightly overweight as it is, and that's feeding them once a week. So two, even three times a week, as some breeders do, uh, you, you're gonna be killing that animal by overfeeding it. So scientific research has actually also found that when a snake eats, it actually puts a tremendous amount of pressure on their body, totally different to when we humans eat. So when a snake actually consumes a meal, it has been found that their heart enlargens, their blood thickens, it is a stressful event for them. And that is another key reason why overfeeding can be so damaging to a snake and why it really is important not to power feed them and to actually have some patience. And it's really, really easy for us as humans to actually not recognize or acknowledge how important that is, because we're used to eating two, three times a day, if not more. Um, but that really is super damaging to snakes. So would you say that a schedule is a useful tool? Absolutely. So we RNG Reptiles have an Excel spreadsheet which we use to track when and how much every single animal in our collection eats. And it's something that I would really strongly recommend to anyone that keeps not just snakes, but any kind of reptile. Once all of our breeders are actually up to size and what I would consider to be fully grown, we will be moving them to being fed every nine days, even once every two weeks, once they're a few years old but none of our animals are actually that kind of age or size yet. Apart from Simon. Apart from Simon, that's true, yeah. Simon Simon is, well, 10, so he, he gets fed once every two weeks now. Perfect. But none of our royal pythons are, are that old or that size yeah. yet. Yeah. Once we have hatchlings, I will say, uh, once we have hatchlings, um, we will be offering them their first meal after their first shed, which, will come pretty quickly after actually leaving the egg. Um, but that will give them the time to absorb any residual yolk that they have coming out of the egg. And they will be fed uh, once every five days as well, um, until they reach kind of 400, 500 grams. Okay. What's the difference between a baby corn snake and a baby python when it comes to what you feed them? Okay, so the biggest difference really on that is size. So when a royal python comes out of the egg, I'd say on average, you're going to be looking at a hatchling that's about 60 to 70 grams. Whereas when a baby corn snake comes out of the egg, you're going to be looking at something that's what, between five and 10 grams. So the size difference is huge, yes. really huge. So what would you feed? Um, what would you feed the python and what would you feed a corn snake? So, a a newly hatched python and corn snake will both have, with us, we will both we will be offering both of them a mouse as their first meal. However, a royal python will be able to go straight to something like a fluff. So just here we've got, a, sorry, a fuzzy. This is a four to six gram fuzzy. So you can see here, it's actually, it has some substance to it. It has the beginnings of fur. Um, 
However, a corn snake is going to be started on a one gram pinky, or basically the smallest pinky I can find. And the reality is that if a corn snake is uh, hatches and it's actually underweight, we're going to be considering either pinky heads, where we're going to have to actually dissect a frozen rodent. Or a tail. Right, <laughs> or a tail. Yeah. Um, if we do offer a tail, it won't be a pinky tail. It'll probably be a, a fluff or a fuzzy tail. Something, again, which actually has some substance. But of course, a tail is going to be a more natural um, and easy to swallow kind of shape compared to a more, I don't know the right term, uh, Round. inconsistently shaped whole animal. Okay, so um, just before we move on to the how, um, I will just uh, kind of elaborate slightly on the fact that when we're defrosting rodents, we will pretty much always defrost fewer rodents than the actual number of animals that we have because inevitably there will be one animal who just isn't hungry enough or, or is in shed. shed or something else and it won't be interested in food at that time um, and I mean currently we have what 13 14 animals once we get hatchlings as well it it's it's just going to be unavoidable that that will happen so it ends up just minimizing waste by not defrosting one for one um, and not only that but particularly royal pythons they can go months literal months and months without eating so if one of the pythons misses a week it will not have any adverse impact on their health um, so that's not something to worry about um, but Despite doing that, if we still end up having excess rodents having been defrosted and prepared for feeding, um, we will never ever refreeze the rodents to defrost them and try to use them again another time. Uh, because you are just asking for bacterial growth, um, bad bacteria that could adversely impact the health of the snakes. So it's just not worth the risk. Additionally, we very rarely, if ever, actually leave the rodents in with the animals. Um, so the common term for that is drop feeding. So we will very rarely, if ever, drop a rodent into a tank or a bin with a snake and just leave it to eat. And the main reason for that is because by doing so, you're immediately contaminating the rodent with whatever bacteria, virus, or unknown contaminant that that snake might actually have. So purely for biosecurity and making sure that if, in, in the unlikely event that one of our snakes is sick, we want to make sure that there's no chance of that being passed on to one of the other snakes. So as a result, we will use a set of tongs, such as we have right here, and we will hold that rodent with the tongs if the snake shows no interest after 10, 15, 20 seconds, we will move on um, on, the under, on the proviso that the snake has not touched the rodent, hasn't gone near it, the rodent hasn't touched the enclosure, anything like that. We will then move on um, and offer said rodent to a different snake. But we would never leave the snake in the tank where the snake could lick it, where the rodent could touch the surroundings or anything like that, and then offer that on. We'll, we wouldn't allow that to happen so as to maintain proper biosecurity in the collection. So as you can probably imagine, it's pretty important that when feeding the snakes, they're all thoroughly defrosted. Um, one of the key differences between the corn snakes and the royal pythons that we keep is that the royal pythons actually have heat sensing pits on either side of the upper jaw um, and because of that they, they actively use them for hunting so when we actually go to feed one of the royal pythons it's pretty important that the animal is actually warm or hot 
so that the royal python can recognize it as prey because obviously in the wild these these snakes are eating live rodents or um or small lizards uh, and they're going to be looking for something that is at approximate body temperature so if you offer a royal python a rodent which is you know, I don't know however warm your house is or however warm your room is some say 20 degrees they're not going to naturally recognize it as a prey item so they're, they're going to be far less inclined to actually eat it um, and when royal pythons are already infamous for being picky eaters you really don't want to be making the situation any worse um, so our process at RNG Reptiles is that on feeding day we will uh, select the appropriate size and quantity of rodents and we'll put them in one of these tubs, one of these containers. Um, we'll leave them to defrost naturally for a couple of hours and then about two hours before we're actually planning on uh, feeding the, the frozen animals off, we will add warm water to the container and every half an hour or so we'll top up the warm water so that um, the rodents actually get to kind of 35 or 40 degrees C all the way through to the core of the animal um, and at that point then we will go to feed the royal pythons. Um, so we do have here a, a heat gun basically um, which I use to actually record the temperature of the rodents to make sure they are warm enough and thoroughly defrosted. Um, we will typically feed the corn snakes first because they're not so fussy about the animals being uh, kind of warm all the way through. In fact, when I first got Simon, all I did was drop feeding and I would only ever defrost kind of naturally in the open air by leaving it to thaw for several hours and I would never warm them up at all. Um, but since getting the royal pythons and that being pretty much a prere prerequisite for them to even eat in the first place, I now just do them all together. So even the pinkies for the baby corn snakes, all of them just get lumped into a container, get brought up to kind of 35, 40 degrees C. Um, for anyone that works in Fahrenheit, that's going to be 95 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then I will allow each of the animals to actually strike feed rather than just drop feed. And as you can probably imagine, <laughs> strike feeding is what it sounds like. So I will actually uh, grab the defrosted rodent with this pair of tongs, hang the rodent into the enclosure where the snake can see it, whether that's see it using the heat pits or see it just using their eyes for the corn snakes and allow them to actually strike and wrap the prey. Um, we have some footage. I will insert footage here. Thank you very much, Gabby. <laughs> Now, having 10 year history with corn snakes and not royal pythons, and then moving into the royal python world, strike feeding was something, as I said, I drop fed Simon for the best part of 10 years. So then starting strike feeding, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, we've, we've had our collection for nearly a year now. We have fed hundreds, if not thousands of rodents. Every time they strike the food, it makes me jump. <laughs> like I have just not gotten used to it yet. I just haven't. But uh, but since starting feeding the royal pythons, where they're required to strike feed, I have offered Simon the same kind of treatment. He has taken, uh, well, he continues to take the opportunity to strike feed, almost as a kind of enrichment, if nothing else. Because let's be honest, for the snakes, actually 
stri striking at an animal that you believe might be alive is just a lot more engaging than eating something which is dead and waiting. Um, so that's how we do it here. Now, excluding the time taken to actually bring the rodents up to temperature, I'd say it probably takes the best part of half an hour if I don't faff on with the picky eaters and I just accept the fact they're not going to eat that week. If I'm really pulling out all the stops to try and make sure every single snake eats, it could take an excess of an hour to actually feed the full collection. Do you think that's about fair, Gabby? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously doing that every week, the time does add up. So it's not a small time commitment, but uh, especially when you compare it to feeding like a dog or a cat where you essentially fill the bowl or give them the treat and it's gone in seconds. You actually have to work to get particularly royal pythons to eat. Yes, <laughs> but it's rewarding because you see them growing and thrive afterwards yeah. and you get the healthy sheds and... Yeah, that's absolutely true. So one last comment really is just a kind of a nod to the herd, a, a bit of an acknowledgement of the fact that each snake has its own character. They are individuals. So, you know, we have some snakes which, honestly, they'd probably eat every day. They will just eat and eat and eat. And we have other snakes which are just picky. They know what they like, and if you don't offer them what they like, they're not gonna eat. They're all kept in a fairly standard environment standard temperatures, standard humidity levels, um, but every snake's different, so they're not all gonna eat on the same kind of schedule. And that's just part of nature, part of the challenge of being a snake keeper and a snake breeder. And that's it. All right, well, that's it for today's video. Um, not too much snake action, but hopefully a little bit of insight for those who don't have a snake collection and, and what it takes to actually feed them. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for watching. If you did like the video and you like the content on the channel, please give us a thumbs up and make sure that you're subscribed. And uh, drop us a comment if there's anything that you do particularly want to see, or if there's anything you don't like, let us know. We'll stop doing that kind of content. Thank you once again from us at RNG Reptiles, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. So the two most common type of rodents by an absolute landslide is going to be mice and rats. What are you doing?